God did not create a meaningless world. God did not create a meaningless world. God did not create that war. And so it is not real. God did not create that airplane crash. And so it is not real. God did not create that car wreck. And so it is not real. God did not create a meaningless world. God did not create a meaningless world. Well, thank you all so much for joining me. I'm Willie from the Ozarks, forgiveness teacher from the Ozarks. I think of myself as Miracle Willie when I'm doing these uh, studies on A Course in Miracles. And we're ready for lesson 14, and we're reading from the Foundation for Inner Peace edition here on, uh, what is it, Sunday, January the 14th of 2024. Uh, New Year's Day for the Greek Orthodox Church. But we'll get into that in a minute if we have time. We've got a longer reading today, and we're going to... Our lesson is actually, uh, God did not create a meaningless world. And the idea for today is, of course, the reason why a meaningless world is impossible. What God did not create does not exist. And everything that does exist, exists as he created it. The world you see has nothing to do with reality. It is your own making and does not exist. What a beginning paragraph. But we're going to put it on hold and we're going to go back and look at our text reading first. It's a longer reading and I want to get it all read today. And, and then we'll go right into our meditation after we've read our uh, our. Uh, lesson for the day. But for our text reading, we're in chapter 2, and we're ready for Roman numeral 5, which is the function of the miracle worker. Before miracle workers are ready to undertake their function in this world, it is essential they fully understand the fear of release. Otherwise, they may unwittingly foster the belief that release is imprisonment a belief that is already already very prevalent. This misperception arises in turn from the belief that harm can be limited to the body. That is because of the underlying fear that the mind can hurt itself. None of these errors are meaningful because the miscreations of the mind do not really exist. This recognition is a far better protective device than any form of level confusion because it introduces correction at the level of the error. It is essential to remember that only the mind can create and that correction belongs at the thought level. Again on that sentence, it is essential to remember that only the mind can create and that correction belongs at the thought level. To amplify an earlier statement, spirit is already perfect and therefore does not require correction. The body does not exist except as a learning device for the mind. This learning device is not subject to errors of its own because it cannot create. It is obvious then that introducing the mind to, oh, excuse me, it is obvious then that inducing the mind to give up its miscreations is the only application of creative ability that is truly meaningful. Two. Magic is the mindless or the miscreative use of mind. Physical medications are forms of spells. But if you are afraid to use the mind to heal, you should not attempt to do so. The very fact that you are afraid makes your mind vulnerable to miscreation. 
You are therefore likely to misunderstand any healing that might occur. And because egocentricity and fear usually occur together, you may be unable to accept the real source of the healing. And the word source is capitalized because all healing is from God. Under these conditions, it is safer for you to rely temporarily on physical healing devices because you cannot misperceive them as your own creations. As long as your sense of vulnerability persists, you should not attempt to perform miracles. <laughs> Paragraph 3. I've already said that miracles are expressions of miracle-mindedness, and miracle-mindedness means right-mindedness. The right-minded right neither exalt nor depreciate the mind of the miracle worker or the miracle receiver. However, as a correction, the miracle need not await the right-mindedness of the receiver. In fact, its purpose is to restore him to his right mind. It is essential, however, that the miracle worker be in his right mind, however briefly or he will be unable to reestablish right-mindedness in someone else. Four, the healer who relies on his own readiness is endangering his understanding. You are perfectly safe as long as you are completely unconcerned about your readiness, but maintain a consistent trust in mine, a trust in, in, in the Holy Spirit's readiness, or Jesus's, however you want to think of it. If your miracle-working inclinations are not functioning properly, it is always because fear has intruded on your right-mindedness and has turned it upside down. All forms of not-right-mindedness are the result of refusal to accept the atonement for yourself. If you do accept it, you are in a position to recognize that those who need healing are simply those who have not realized that right-mindedness is healing. Five, the sole responsibility of the miracle worker is to accept the atonement for himself. And let me put the definition of atonement in there. The sole responsibility of the miracle worker is to accept the interlocking chain of complete forgiveness for himself. This means you recognize that mind is the only creative level and that its errors are healed by the atonement or that complete forgiveness. Once you accept this, your mind can only heal. By denying your mind any destructive potential and reinstating its purely constructive powers, you place yourself in a position to undo the level confusion of others. The message you then give to them is the truth that their minds are similarly constructive and their miscreations cannot hurt them. By affirming this, you release the mind from over-evaluating its own learning device and restore the mind to its true position as the learner. Six, it should be emphasized again that the body does not learn any more than it creates. As a learning device, it merely follows the learner. But if it is falsely endowed with self-initiative, it becomes a serious obstruction to the very learning it should facilitate. Only the mind is capable of illumination. Spirit is already illuminated, and the body is, too, is in itself too dense. The spirit is already illuminated, and the body in itself is too dense. The mind, however, can bring its illumination to the body by recognizing that it is not the learner and is therefore unamenable to learning. The body is, however, easily brought into alignment with a mind that has learned to look beyond it toward the light. Remember the inner light we're trying to release? Well, use the mind and go inside and release it. Don't think that you're going to see it on the outside. It's an inner thing. <laughs> Paragraph 7. Corrective learning always begins with the re excuse me, corrective learning always begins with the awakening of spirit and the turning away from the belief in physical sight. This often entails fear because you are afraid of what your spiritual sight will show you. 
I said before that the Holy Spirit cannot see error and is capable only of looking beyond it to the defense of the atonement. There is no doubt that this may produce discomfort, yet the discomfort is not the final outcome of the perception. When the Holy Spirit is permitted to look upon the defilement of the altar, he also looks immediately toward the atonement. Nothing he perceives can induce fear. Everything that results from spiritual awareness is merely channelized to inward correction. Discomfort is aroused only to bring the need for correction into awareness. And we're going to get a lot into that today when we do our meditation. But we'll go right on through our fears, right on to the truth that, that, that um, only God is real. Paragraph 8. The fear of healing arises in the end from an unwillingness to accept unequivocally that healing is necessary. What the physical eye sees is not corrective, nor can error be corrected by any device that can be seen physically. As long as you believe in what your physical sight tells you, your attempts at correction will be misdirected. The real vision is obscured because you cannot endure to see your own defiled altar. But since the altar has been defiled, your state becomes doubly dangerous unless it is perceived. 9. Healing is an ability that developed after the separation, before which it was unnecessary. Like all aspects of the belief in space and time, it is temporary. However, as long as time persists, Healing is needed as a means of protection. This is because healing rests on charity, and charity is a way of perceiving the perfection of another, even if you cannot perceive it in yourself. Most of the loftier concepts of which you are capable now are time-dependent. Charity is really a weaker reflection of a much more powerful love encompassment that is far beyond any form of charity you can conceive of as of, as of yet. Charity is essential to right-mindedness in the limited sense in which it can now be attained. In the last paragraph, 10, charity is a way of looking at another as if he had already gone far beyond his actual accomplishments in time. Since his own thinking is faulty, he cannot see the atonement for himself, or he would have no need of charity. The charity that is according him, excuse me, the charity that is accorded him is both an acknowledgement that he needs help and a recognition that he will accept it. Both of these perceptions clearly imply their dependence on time, making it apparent that charity still lies within the limitations of this world. I said before that only revelation transcends time. The miracle as an expression of charity can only shorten it. It must be understood, however, that whenever you offer a miracle to another, you are shortening the suffering of both of you. This corrects retroactively as well as progressively. Wow, you can use a miracle to correct what's already happened. Okay, well, let's go look now in our, uh, our, our lesson for the day. Lesson 14, God did not create a meaningless world. And uh, let's see, what's our time? We're, we've got just a little bit. Let's take a moment. And what's going on around the world? It's uh, Caesarean Section Day. First Caesarean Section was done in in 1500s in Switzerland, but it couldn't be documented till 82 years later. So who got the credit was done was uh, Jesse Bennett on January the 14th of 1794, and he he performed it on his wife Elizabeth, and they had their child Maria. Uh, Feast of the ass, donkey celebration. Um, Feast of the Donkey. It's a celebration of all the donkeys in the Bible, like Balaam, Balaam, Balaam's ass and Jesus' entry into uh, the city of peace. A donkey is the equus asinus, and a donkey 
is the word in it uh, is um, what well, donkey donkey in Spanish is burro and donkey in Italian is ass. <laughs> That's how what I meant to say. But it's the Equus asinus. International Kite Day, and I found that the largest kite ever made was, believe it or not, 6,781 square feet. <laughs> big, big. Uh, 630 square meters. National Dress Up Your Pet Day. Uh, you know, the highest kite, I may say that too, flew up to 16,038 feet. And that was done on in 2014 in Australia. And that largest kite was in China. Dress up your pet day. What else do we have going on today? National Hot Pastrami Sandwich Day. National Sunday Supper Day. Have Sunday Supper with your family. Organize your home day after you organize your house. Orthodox New Year, and that's with Russian, uh, Serbia, and other Eastern European countries. So Happy New Year, you Eastern Orthodox. Ratification Day, when the U.S. Constitution or the U.S. Congress uh, ratified the Treaty of Paris that officially ended the Revolutionary War on uh, this day in 1784. Take a Missionary to Lunch Day and World Logic Day. And in our, um, in our edible landscaping, I want to tell you just real quickly about Bala Mersal pomegranate, considered one of the best varieties for juicing, having 70% juice and 12 to 20% sugar. Fruit can keep for three to four months. Bala is a medium to large fruit, speckled pink, red rind, Seeds pop when you chew them, zone seven through nine, and self-fruitful. And I found on the website that they said it was also about, it was as hardy as the one we read about yesterday, the uh, Salavatsky, the one from Russia. So it may actually do good in zone six also. And its uh, genus and species is the Punica granatum. And then out of our... Um, Permaculture for beginners, we're going to talk about aphids, a notorious destructive garden pest. Aphids reproduce asexually and build populations rapidly. Predators include parasitic wasps, hoverfly larvae, lacewing larvae, ladybirds, and spiders. And ladybirds is the European word for what we call ladybugs. Okay, now let's read lesson 14. God did not create a meaningless world. The idea for today is, of course, the reason why a meaningless world is impossible. What God did not create does not exist, and everything that does exist exists as he created it. The world you see has nothing to do with reality. It is of your own making and does not exist. Oh, the power of the mind. We can make this whole world, but if we have thoughts that are not according to reality, then we're going to create a world that's not according to reality. And that's what we want to free ourselves from. The exercises for today are to be practiced with eyes closed throughout. The mind searching period should be short, a minute at most. Do not have more than three practice periods for today, today's idea, unless you find them comfortable. If you do, it will be because you really understand what they are for. The idea for today is another step in learning to let go the thoughts that you have written on the world and see the Word of God in their place. The early steps in this exchange, which can truly be called salvation, can be quite difficult and even quite painful. Some of them will lead you directly into fear. You will not be left there. You will go far beyond it. Our direction is toward perfect safety and perfect peace. With eyes closed, think of all the horrors in the world that cross your mind. Name each one as it occurs to you and then deny its reality. God did not create it, and so it is not real. Say, for example, God did not create that war, and so it is not real. God did not create that airplane crash, and so it is not real. God did not create that, and you specify whatever disaster. 
and so it is not real. Suitable subjects for the application of today's idea also include anything you are afraid might happen to you or to anyone about whom you are concerned. In each case, name the disaster quite specifically. Do not use general terms. For example, do not say God did not create illness, but God did not create cancer or heart attack or whatever may arouse fear in you. This is your personal repertory of horrors at which you are looking. These things are part of the world you see. Some of them are shared illusions, and others are part of your personal hell. It does not matter. What God did not create can only be... And let me turn the page here. What God did not create can only be in your own mind apart from His, whether you share it with somebody else or not. Therefore, it has no meaning. In other words, you might personally be afraid that you're going to get a, have a heart attack, where you might look at the news and say and realize that a whole bunch of people believe that there's a war going on. And either way, we want to learn to say God did not create that war or that heart attack and so it is not real. There's a reality behind the appearance that we see with the eyes. What God did not create can only be in your own mind apart from his. And we don't want anything apart from God. Therefore, it has no meaning. In recognition of this fact, conclude the practice period by repeating today's idea. God did not create a meaningless world. The idea for today can, of course, be applied to anything that disturbs you during the day, aside from the practice periods. Be very specific in applying it. Say, God did not create a meaningless world. He did not create and specify the situation which is disturbing you, and so it is not real. So we can use this to help free us from from pains that we're experiencing during the during the day and our word for peace uh, since since it's New Year's in uh, the Greek Orthodox Church uh, and Serbia is one of the countries that uses that a lot of people that practice Greek Orthodox religion live in the word for Serbia also for Russia is M-I-R mir so May mirror be with you. Peace be with you. God did not create a meaningless world. God did not create a meaningless world. God did not create that war and so it is not real God did not create that airplane crash and so it is not real God did not that pick up wreck and so it is not real God did not create that car wreck and so it is not real God did not And so it is not real God did not create that death And so it is not real God did not create that angry 
argument and so it is not real God did not create you fill in the blank and so it is not real God did not One more. God did not create the heavens, and so it is not real. God did not create the meaningless world. God did not create the meaningless world. You can use this during the day if you find yourself fretting over something, you're, you're afraid or you're scared of something or you, any kind of personal disaster or, or group disaster. Apply this. Say, God did not create a meaningless world. God did not create and specify what your fear is. And then say, and so it is not real. And be sure to do it at least three times today for about a minute. Maybe you did one right now. God did not create a meaningless world. Mirror.